uh, thank you very much for being with us. Um, before we kind of dive into the complexities of the trade talks, I'm just keen to ask you about a story on the front page of the Mail on Sunday today, which claims to have seen leaked emails from a Treasury advisor suggesting that actually Britain doesn't need farmers at all, that we could just uh, import our food, follow the example of uh, Singapore, which is rich without having its own agricultural sector. So do we need farmers? Well, look, I haven't seen the piece. I've only seen bits and pieces on social media. But uh, I think, you know, the, the reference to comparing Britain with Singapore, I mean, Singapore has five million people uh, and, and doesn't have any farmed landscape. So it, it actually has to import uh, all its food. Whereas, of course, here, 75 percent of Britain is a farmed landscape. We have a fantastic maritime climate in which to produce our food. Uh, and, of course, we have 60-plus million people here to feed. So there is a sort of moral imperative, if you like, for us to be able to produce food um, here in this country. So absolutely, we need our farmers. And, of course, we're the bedrock of the largest manufacturing sector providing all those, those raw ingredients. And currently, um, Sophie, at 60% self-sufficiency. At the same time, you say there's a moral imperative, but is there a cold-hearted economic case to say that actually uh, farming is you know, a relatively small uh, amount of uh, GDP? Why should farmers be given tax breaks when we could import food? Well, clearly there is a sort of, as you say, a cold economic case. But look, I think you have to look at the wider aspect of, of all of this. You know, farms are the, the backbone of rural Britain the allied trade, those jobs that are linked to farming. And as I say, we're the largest manufacturing sector. Surely the last thing we want to go to is importing cheaper raw ingredients produced to lower standards. We export our conscience and our production. And with climate change and everything else, you know, I've set the pitch, set the agenda that we want to be global leaders in climate-friendly farming. There's a real opportunity for this government to lead based on standards and integrity and actually putting farmers at the forefront of delivering on climate change. So we have to see this as an opportunity and, and comparisons with Singapore are, are just completely out of touch with where this country is. Given uh these emails. Um, the UK, of course, about to go into some really important trade negotiations with the EU, but also, of course, with the US. Are you a bit worried that farmers could be about to be sold down the river here? Look, of course we're concerned. I've been talking about nothing else, you know, for the last three years. It is absolutely paramount that we get trade right. We've asked for legislation in the Agriculture Bill. We've asked for a commission really to scrutinise these trade deals and to provide our offer for what agri-food is going to be on, on the world stage. Um, we haven't had answers to any of those yet. Um, we still, you were interviewing George Eustace last weekend, this is still being discussed. We await the publication of the objectives. But it is absolutely fundamental that we do not open up our borders effectively to cheap raw ingredients that would be illegal to produce here. The British consumer really values animal welfare and environmental protection as well as food safety. So those imports have to meet the same standards that we have here, which is why we feel we need the Commission and the legislation in the Agriculture Bill. Let's talk about those standards in particular, um, because Last month, the previous Environment Secretary, Theresa Villiers, said that we won't be importing chlorinated chicken or hormone-treated beef uh, from the United States. Um, you referenced my interview with George Eustace last weekend, who's taken over that brief. He said that those things are currently illegal and the government has no plans to change that. I mean, do you get the sense that the position on things like hormone-treated beef, chlorinated chicken, has been relaxing or softening slightly? Look, uh, I've always seen it as, uh, you know, a negotiation, if you like, here. You know, it's clear the people of this country want to maintain the standards that we have. The farmers want to maintain the standards that we have. The environmentalists want to maintain that. There is a what real shared belief. Well, there are many. I, I said at our conference last week, you know, this is a moral compass test for some in government. You know, we know that not everybody in government uh, values that, but I will continue to make the case it is the right thing uh, to do. And, and we talk about chlorinated chicken. It's actually not about the chlorination of chicken. That is perfectly safe to eat. It's about the production methods that sit behind that. And, you know, here we, we have rules, we have legislation on stocking density, on veterinary advice, on bedding, on light. In other countries, they do not have 
any of those rules, any of that legislation in many countries across the world. Indeed, a lot of them with feedlot systems, prophylactic feeding of antibiotics to act as a growth stimulant. We banned all of that here uh, 30 years ago. So why would we want to go back there? This surely is the chance to lead be on the world stage, driving standards and integrity forwards, not going back to the dark ages, undermining our farmers and ultimately putting them out of business. I don't think anybody in government wants to see that happen. Um, you mentioned there the moral compass of some in government. Um, and in an interview with Politico earlier this week, you suggested that George Eustace might not wield quite the same authority, perhaps, or influence uh, as someone like Michael Gove. I don't doubt his sincerity, but this is heavyweight political discussions. It will be testing the moral compass of some. Are you confident that the current Environment Secretary has got the clout to protect farmers, as you would see it, when the going gets tough? Look, George Eustace absolutely understands his brief inside out. He's been in the department since 2013. Uh, he's a passionate advocate of, of British farming. But this is, you know, whoever is in his job has the same challenge. This approach has to be hardwired across government. So, you know, this cannot sit with any one man, indeed any one department. This has to absolutely come from the top, be hardwired across government, and every department has to be bought into that ambition. When you were last on the show um, during the Conservative leadership campaign last summer, uh, you said that you'd written to Boris Johnson uh, and about concerns of a no-deal Brexit and hadn't heard anything back. I'm just wondering, you were saying a little bit earlier that you haven't had answers on everything from the government. Has communication improved with Number 10? Are you having meetings with ministers? Um, look, we're, we're meeting regularly with, with uh, DEFRA ministers um, and I met with uh, Liz Truss in the Department of International Trade not that long ago. Um, I haven't had the chance to meet the Prime Minister yet. We have written. It would be, um, I think, a much needed meeting to discuss the opportunity in all of this. I think we spend a lot of time discussing the negative aspect. I really do think there is an enormous opportunity. Um, for Britain to lead on the world stage. The WTO is bereft of leadership at the moment. Um, but we have to make sure that for my sector, those, those values, if you like, that we hold so dear are embedded in trade deals. And of course, you know, we face the prospect of a, of a no deal situation. If we can't agree the EU relationship, we can't agree um, uh, trade deals before next January, we, we are back into the no deal prospect. So, you know, we have to get this right. We absolutely uh, have to make sure we prioritise the EU relationship. Um, and I, I think there's a huge opportunity once we've done that with the bilateral with the US and indeed other trade agreements across the world. OK, uh, and just finally, flooding is still, of course, affecting large parts of the country, many farms impacted. Are you getting enough support? Um, look, I, I can't tell you how bad this is. You know, we've got a third of the country that is underwater. We've got very little planting done. Um, there's been communities, rural communities, urban communities flooded. We feel that farmers are the solution in all this. We published a flood manifesto in 2012. We relaunched it again in 2016. Nothing has changed. You know, we are going to have to invest in our water infrastructure. There's a great opportunity for us to be able to store water, so we pay farmers to store water, and then potentially we can move it, which the English water companies are now talking about, we can move it to areas where we need it most uh, in the drier months of the year, and of course use it for irrigation once it's stored. You know, we are importing a vast amount of our fruit and vegetables. We only produce 7% of our fruit here. There's a fantastic opportunity for us to produce much more fruit here, and we have the water. We have a bountiful supply of water, and we are sourcing uh, that fruit and veg from from water scarce parts of the country so I think this is an opportunity to have a major reset on water infrastructure and of course climate change uh, constantly changing weather events more extreme we, we've got to do it we've got to bite the bullet and invest in our water infrastructure okay minute batters thank you very much for coming on the program this morning thank you